The Radio Whammo Breakfast. Talking politics with Russell Norman. Co-leader of the Greens, Russell Norman. Good morning to you, Russell. Morning, Whammo. How's it going? Good, good. Um, three topics to get through this morning. White bait, floods and overseas prisoners. Let's start with white bait. White bait season. Is it white bait season now or has it just started? Uh, it just started on the weekend, except in the West Coast where it's a bit delayed. OK, so um, there is potentially an issue with um, with white bait at the moment because some uh, scientists are saying that it is endangered. Yeah, a number of the white bait fish. So white bait are like the juvenile stages of um, some of our native fish, uh, and some of those fish are now quite endangered. Um, so the numbers are, are really down, uh, and it's basically being driven by habitat destruction and water pollution, hmm. uh, which is you know threatening our native fish. So not necessarily the white baiters themselves. Wait, say that again, sorry. So it's not necessarily the white baiters themselves that have that has caused um, the the you know, the drop in numbers. It's um, it's as these other issues like pollution. Yeah, there there are questions about whether um, we should be uh, you know fishing um, threatened species. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the key drivers um, are actually habitat destruction and pollution. I mean, obviously, overfishing of white bait um, can be a real problem, and that's why there's a whole bunch of pretty strict rules about it, mm. um, about the size of your nets and how you've got to stay with it the whole time and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it can have a dramatic impact, because if you string a net right across the entrance to a river, you can catch basically every juvenile fish returning from the sea, and um, that, that will be the end of the white bait in that particular catchment. So do we so, have, do we have yeah. any conclusive research on this? Uh, there's been a lot of work done uh, looking at native fish. Um, well, there's been some work done, I should say. I mean, we haven't, uh, as a nation, invested a lot in research on native fish, but um, we know that habitat destruction is one of the key things. Um, when you do test, if you run um, if you run native fish up uh, kind of like water channels, artificial water channels in research, and down one channel you have polluted water, um, which, you know, has dairy F1 or whatever in it, um, and in the other channel you have clean water, the fish always choose the clean water channel. They, they really try to avoid the polluted rivers. And then we know where they lay their um, their eggs is that their, their eggs are uh, laid in these um, reeds by the sides of rivers. Mm. So if you destroy all that riparian habitat, um, then you destroy the, the habitat for where the native fish breed. So what, um, so effectively, what are you saying? Stop white baiting? Um, I'd actually say, look, this, you know, let's save the white bait fritter by actually um, getting the pollution out of our rivers and restoring the habitat by the sides of the rivers. That that would be my my emphasis. Okay, on to the next topic, floods. Um, floods over in Pakistan uh, that are kind of beyond comprehension, really. Um, are they, uh, in your view, uh, another sign of uh, climate change? Uh, what, what you can say about any, any individual event is pretty limited. So you yeah. can't say any particular flooding event is connected to climate change. What, what you can say is that the incidence and severity of flooding events will increase as a result of climate change. And there's pretty strong evidence now that that's what's going on. Um, the world's one of the world's biggest reinsurance companies, a company called Munich Re, um, which is a company that insures insurance companies. Um, it, so it has a lot of data about the cost of flooding events. And there, they put out a, a report very recently which suggests that uh, there's been a very significant increase in, the, in flooding events, even when you take into account changes in population and reporting and a whole bunch of other things that we are seeing in increase in flooding events and the severity of them. Mm. And uh, lessons for us here in New Zealand? Well, it, it just means we need to think ahead. Like, well, you know, the, the Greens put a lot of emphasis on um, reducing greenhouse emissions, which is the right thing to do. But we also need to be thinking about adaptation. Um, so, you know, when we're building bridges or um, permitting houses, we need to think, are these bridges and houses, uh, you know, are they in the right place and do they, will they be able to cope with more extreme weather events? Yeah. So, if you, you know, when people want to build coastal housing, um, how is it going to cope with increased sea level rise? Mm. I mean, what investment you know, will they expect in the future from the community to protect that housing when sea level does rise? So we need to be thinking ahead, um, you know, 50 years or more um, in terms of adaptation, how we're going to deal with 
uh, sea level rise and increased flooding events. Mm. OK, um, and yesterday in Parliament you asked the Minister of Foreign Affairs, you asked the question, can he guarantee that no prisoners taken in operations involving New Zealand Special Air Service in Afghanistan were transferred to the uh, National Di- uh, Directorate of Security in Kabul and tortured? What kind, yeah. of, what kind of response did you get and was it satisfactory? Uh, I, I, I don't think it was satisfactory. Certainly uh, Murray McCulley, the foreign minister, did everything he could uh, to avoid answering the question. Um, uh, what, what basically he, he said, and, and this, you know, it's pretty clear now what's going on, the SAS are involved in these joint operations with the Afghan um, forces, and the Afghan forces capture the prisoners um, so they are legally responsible for them, and then they hand them out over to be tortured. Um, so uh, what the New Zealand government's saying is, look, the, we don't, um, there's no prisoners captured by the SAS. Um, we just happen to be there working alongside them. Mm. Um, so if the SAS were to capture any prisoners, obviously we'd do the right thing. But when the Afghans that we're kind of standing next to do the capturing, even though we've helped and we've all got guns, um, then they get handed over to be tortured, and that's not really any of our business. So, you so know, I, I actually think it's you know very it's a, it's a completely immoral position because we all know what's going on. So it's kind of see no evil, hear no evil. That's right. Look the other way. Yeah. Well, people have uh, you know you know the torture is pretty severe, like amputations, you know deprivation of sleep and food and everything else, and beatings and electrocutions mm. and the, the whole gamut. It's absolutely terrifying and disgusting and. They're prisoners that we're helping to catch. Mm. Thanks very, very much, uh, Russell. How's, how's the commute this morning in Wellington? Um, not too bad. The bus seemed all right. I just got off it. Just got <laughs> off it. Uh, everything flowing smoothly? Uh, well, it was from where I came in, from Hatai Tai, but I couldn't speak for the rest of it. Hey, thanks very much, Russell. We'll catch you next week. Okay, thanks very much. Co-leader of the Greens, Russell.